grazie ancora a tutti voi Jeremy Jeremy ti aspetto qui sul palco ecco il prossimo primo ministro del Regno Unito Thank you very much for that fantastic welcome and thank you all for coming here today. I want to begin by saying this. Today's Socialist Together conference is a great initiative. And when Jani invited me to speak, I was delighted to accept. I want to thank you all, participating organizations from many different countries for being here today. To take part and contribute to the critical debate about the future of socialist and progressive politics and the future of our continent. There can be no doubt the enthusiasm of all of you here today. Our movement, brimming with passion, brimming with ideas. We need, all of us, to seize this opportunity, to channel the, that enthusiasm, come together, share those ideas, and turn them into action and real change. Since the financial crash, we've seen, seen years of austerity all across Europe. That was a political choice shaped by ideology, which has crippled many parts of our economies, encouraged the dismantling of our public services all across Europe, and driven down wages and living standards. In many countries, Welfare and social security have been hit by the full force of the austerity agenda. You see the symptoms of it, of homeless people around railway stations all across Europe. You see the desperation of increasing levels of real poverty in many parts of Europe. It's wrong, it's unnecessary, it's immoral, and it is unacceptable to us as socialists. the targeting of the very poorest in our society. At the same time, the necessity of large-scale and vital public investments has all but been abandoned. As a neoliberal dogma has allowed many of our valuable public assets to be sold cheaply to the benefit of the few at the expense of the many. Beyond Europe's borders, we've seen war and climate change drive the mass displacement of people and forced migration, a refugee crisis on a scale not seen since the Second World War, tearing apart communities and families. That, in turn, is being exploited by some of the most ugly elements in our politics. People who are determined to promote fear and division within our societies. All of this against a backdrop where our world is slipping back towards the threat of global conflict, spurred on by national egotism and neo-imperial ambition, and where human and democratic rights, including freedom of speech, are increasingly coming under pressure on the fringes and even within the borders of the European Union. These are some of the challenges that face us and the people that we represent. For millions of people across our continent, the current system is failing. Failing to deliver secure jobs, failing to deliver rising living standards, and failing to deliver a safe and secure future. Instead of seeing the current system and the long-promoted panacea of deregulated markets as a solution to their problems, people across Europe see them as the cause of their problems. People no longer have faith that globalization can bring a future of prosperity and security, or that political business as usual will roll back the rampant growth of inequality. Young people are angry at being forced into debt and insecurity. And let me make this very clear. People of all ages, 
all backgrounds and all communities unite together in wanting change in the way our politics is done all across Europe. Yet, since the economic crash and the enforcement of a failed austerity, the people that we represent have too often not associated the left and wider progressive politics with the change that they want. Instead, we've witnessed the opposite. We've seen right-wing nationalist and racist movements reap the benefits of a broken system. And for many of those people who feel angry, held back and left behind, the voices of those on the extreme right often sound more radical than those on the left. For too long, the most prominent voices in our movement have looked out of touch, too willing to defend the status quo and the established order. In a desperate attempt to defend and protect what is seen as the centre ground in politics, only to find that the centre ground has shifted or was never where the elites claimed it was in the first place. From Donald Trump in the United States, Marine Le Pen in France, or UKIP in Britain, to the very worrying rise of the far right elsewhere in Europe, including most recently in Austria. Our broken system has provided fertile ground for the growth of nationalist and xenophobic politics. Now we all know that their politics of hate, blame and division are not the answer. But unless we offer a clear and radical alternative of credible solutions to the problems people face, unless we offer a chance to change the broken system, unless we offer hope, offer hope of a more equitable and prosperous future, we are clearing the path for the extreme right to make even more far-reaching inroads into our communities and their message of fear and division to become the political mainstream of our discourse. But we can offer a radical alternative. We have the ideas to make progressive politics the dominant force of this century. But if we don't get our message right, don't stand up for our core beliefs, and we don't represent change, we will founder and stagnate. For a start, the neoliberal economic model is broken. It doesn't work for most people. Inequality and low taxes for the richest are hurting our people and harming the economy, as even the International Monetary Fund now acknowledges. That's why our thinking can and must become the new mainstream. As we develop a new consensus of how to run an economy for the many, not the few. That rewards the real wealth creators. That means all of us, not the wealth extractors. We must build an economy fit for the 21st century with a democratic state at its heart that's not afraid to act when something goes wrong, but also to shape and drive innovation and investment in the cutting edge technologies of the future. This new consensus includes not only regulation, but also new forms of public cooperative and social ownership. It should be a government's duty to make sure that regulation keeps pace with an ever-changing world. And for too long, calls for sensible and necessary regulation of working conditions and employment standards across Europe have been ignored, allowing wages to be held down and fueling the resentment of many held back and neglected by the existing system. We cannot continue to make these mistakes. The, technological, the technology of the digital age 
offers us an opportunity to empower workers and to cooperate on a scale not possible before. But it's also enabled a more exploitive form of capitalism to emerge. Look at Uber, Deliveroo, look at Amazon, and look at others. The platform... <laughs> the platforms these companies use are the technologies of the future. But too often, too often, their business models depend not on technological advantage, but on establishing an effective monopoly in their market and using that monopoly to drive down wages and working conditions to or even through the floor. Socialists must rise to this challenge for the future and radically rethink how to shape the development of our economies and societies over the next generation. Using the power of new technology to make our economy work for the many, not the few. And, whilst, and while the economic downturn takes hold, we must never forget our responsibilities in tackling climate change and finding solutions to the impact of global warming. It is shameful that the United States President wants to pull out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement with the future of our planet at stake. We, as socialists, should be the loudest voices in condemning such myopic and potentially catastrophic acts. We must also think collectively about how we address other global challenges. Never has the time been more important to restate our commitment to the United Nations Charter, the third clause of which states its aim is to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems. With the problems facing us of nuclear proliferation, climate change, the humanitarian crises of Syria, Yemen, and of the Rohingya people in Myanmar, a global agenda driven by socialist principles is more necessary now than it has ever been in our history. Whether it's the belligerence and provocation of Donald Trump or Kim Jong-un, what's evidently essential is calm, rational dialogue and cooperation. And across the world, our movement must play a huge role as a spur to development, empowering women, bringing communities together. In a world of aggressive reaction and macho posturing, let us, as socialists, be the voice of diplomacy, the voice of peace. And as Europe continues to be swept up in an ongoing migration and refugee crisis, all socialists all socialists must stand together in support of a humane and collective response to help those people who've been made victims of war and climate change. <clears throat> our whole DNA, our whole well-being is one of a humanitarian and decent response and recognizing that people are victims of a situation not of their own making and want to contribute to our world just like we all do. Sometimes it seems hard to do these things, but it must be the left, the socialists, that show leadership in the refugee crisis. There are still people in the Mediterranean fleeing war and persecution, many from North Africa as well as from the wider Middle East. We need a progressive and coherent joined up approach. This includes a fair sharing system and legal pathways of admission. And our response must be matched by broader efforts by all concerned to address the root causes behind the migration pressures. Create people better protection whilst they're in transit. Address smuggling and trafficking. Individual countries cannot be left to solve this crisis alone. I want to pay tribute to the outstanding work of anti-racist and peace movements 
all across Europe. Friends, we must defend human rights, democracy, and social justice within our borders. That is what we as socialists must do. <clears throat> the attack on freedom of speech and on academics in some parts of Europe should not and cannot ever be tolerated. We cannot silence voices of reason by irrational acts by any state. Europe is the birthplace of the Enlightenment, of democracy, the labor movement, and socialism. But it's also been the cradle of racist colonialism, fascism, the slave trade, and the most terrible crimes in human history. The struggle for the best of Europe and its progressive traditions against that other European leg legacy must be vigilant and must be unending. Let's not forget these freedoms are central to all of us. We've also been proud to stand up to those breaches when they occur outside the European Union. We must be doubly determined to stand up to abuses when they happen inside our own borders. The issue of Brexit is obviously a huge one in Britain. Let me be clear. The British Labour Party does not see anyone in Europe as an enemy. We see people across Europe as friends. <clears throat> You're our colleagues, our partners, our comrades, and our friends. Our commitment is clear. We must and will respect the result of the EU referendum, but at the same time build a new, close, and cooperative relationship with our fellow Europeans based on our common interests. We are internationalists. So, I urge all leaders on all sides, the UK and the UK, the UK and the European Union must take the steps together. There is no room and no need for insults or divisive posturing. It is our responsibility to build a relationship that will continue to thrive for generations to come. And we in the Labour Party are determined to achieve that. To all European Union nationals who live and work and contribute to British society, we thank you. We thank you for being our friends, our colleagues and neighbours. And we will do all we can to make sure you will continue to be welcome and continue to call Britain your home. In the referendum, our party, the Labour Party, campaigned to remain and reform. And that call for reform of European Union institutions and rules in the interest of the many is echoed by many friends and allies across Europe. We will resist any attempt by British Conservatives to use Brexit to try and create any kind of deregulated tax haven off the shores of Europe. That is not on our agenda. A deal that works for us all, all of us, is essential both for Britain and the whole of Europe. We will continue to work with you and many others across Europe. And of course, Europe is bigger than just the European Union on climate change, challenging the grip of corporate power and many other issues, inside or outside the EU. Progressive advances in every part of our continent, every part of our continent, strengthen us all. Many establishment commentators have been determined to write the left off, to write socialism out of the agenda. In Britain, we were told we had no chance no chance, we were told, just before the recent general election. And although we did not quite win the election, I think you would agree we comprehensively proved our critics wrong. We delivered 
the largest increase in Labour's votes since 1945, increasing our vote by 3 million between 2015 and 2017. <clears throat> we showed that with a combination of the enthusiasm of on-the-ground campaigning, of street meetings, of rallies, of bringing people together of all ages, all backgrounds, all communities, using the cutting edge of social media, it is possible to mobilize millions of people around a radical, transformational, socialist agenda of what the future could look, look like. It is, my friends, possible to win those arguments if you engage with them and put them out there. And we will continue to do that. If our message is bold and our message is radical, if we listen to what the majority actually want, we will prove the elites and their pundits wrong that we in this movement have the enthusiasm, the ability and the ideas to change this world. But I know we can only do it when we work together work together in our own countries, work together across national borders, work together internationally. That surely is what makes us socialists in the first place. The sharing of wealth, the sharing of ideas, and that fundamental belief that every human being has a right to a decent and reasonable life, every child has a right to be able to achieve the fullest potential they can. The injustice, the unfairness, and the inequality of so many of the current systems leave millions left behind, leave millions desperate and angry, and lead to a divided and unhealthy society. Working together, maintaining those values, using every technique we can to campaign on them, we challenge inequality and injustice wherever it is. Working together, we can achieve that change and achieve that better world. We have so many things that unite us across national borders, that desire and that thirst for change. And you know what? Together, working together, we can challenge inequality and injustice, achieve that better world that we all so desperately want and strive for. And to me, it's a real pleasure and a real honor to be invited by Jenny to come here today and share a few thoughts with you on behalf of the labor movement in Britain. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. moderating with you of the Q&A. First of all, it was very interesting to see the tweets coming in because you were referred to I as... I can't see any I know, tweets. but shall I tell you how you were referred to? Once as Jezza, I don't know if that was a person in the room, who, who did the tweet about Jezza and Islington North? And then we also had... Uh, was it you there? Okay, and we also had that you were the absolute boy as well. Who did... Who tweeted the absolute boy? Yes. <laughs> it's you, it's the... He's, he's 19, but he says people think he's 35 because of the beard. But we have that old conversation. But he's got a brilliant beard. Well done. Thank you so much. <laughs> Beards of the world unite. You've nothing to use, lose but your hair. <laughs> so we have about, I think, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, we're going to take three questions at a time. Sure. Now, the, what, what I'm going to say to the room, and don't shoot the messenger, is we are looking for questions, not for people for whom hardcore politics is their real day job, and not from the media on this occasion. We're going to look further afield at the wider participants in the room, okay? So, a gentleman here will take a question from you, and then let's just have a look. I think somebody's going to try not to throw that at your head. Have a look at that coming now, sir, please. 
Oh, it always terrifies Very me. Right, good. one Very there. Good. Let's just see. Is there another question? Another question? Are you a wider participant? Yes, good, great. So we chuck to this gentleman. And should we have a lady? Go on, chuck to the... There's a lady there with long hair. Go on, we've got a lady there. Oh, God, that's a long way to Is throw. this sort of cricket or baseball oh, practice God. or I don't something? Know. It's wonderful. Uh, maybe throw from the front, if you could. Come and throw. You're, you're going to do a better job, and you, you don't risk injuring her. Now, while we do the throw, we can hear from... Go on, you can start us off, my dear, actually. Let's hear... No, ladies and gents, you know, the, the, you know the, the drill nice and short, please. Thank you. Do you want to start us off? Yes. And hold it nice and high so we can hear you and so can the interpreters. Uh, Gianni Pitel actually announced you as the new Prime Minister for UK. <laughs> <laughs> so we would like to hear from you when you will become the new Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do you think that you will try to reintegrate UK in the EU? Okay. Thank you for those. Okay, where is our other blue box gentleman? Yes, do you want to stand and say who you are, please? Just hold it. it you, no, just the top. Oh, hello, yours isn't working. Can you take the ladies? Go on, chuck it. Let's do more throwing. Perfect. Hello. Hi, my name is Pranav and I'm from India. I absolutely love you, Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> uh, my question is that, uh, do you think it's actually possible to regulate the sharing economy? I mean, when we say that it's high time that Uber drivers uh, sort of own Uber, is that possible? And uh, is, is that, can, can we envis envisage a future where the drivers of Uber can reinvest their profits and build a sustainable company that looks after their interests? How do we do that? Okay, Thanks. Th thank you. Good question. Thank you very much. And we had a third question there from the gentleman here. Yes, please stand and let us know who you are. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Behan um, from the last year uh, in the secondary school, uh, in St. Peter's Wolwe in Brussels. Um, I have a question for you. Um, what is your stance and what is your opinion on the... No. What are the negative and positive consequences for uh, England leaving from um, the UK, leaving from the EU for Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States? Okay. Should we take those three first? Are we happy to? Okay, let's explore those three, whichever. So we had, well, we had two questions about, about the UK and the EU there. When are you going to become Prime Minister? That was the first one. Uh, and also, is it possible to regulate the sharing economy? And then we had a look at what happens with the UK and the EU, and where will the UK be going? Is it going to be looking at Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the USA, and what are the implications of that? Um, we fought the general election campaign from a difficult start. I have to, everybody acknowledges that. And we gained a great deal of support during the campaign because we challenged the status quo and we challenged the politics of austerity and the uh, politics of choice, which is to essentially cut public spending, roll back the state, and um, lead to greater levels of inequality. And uh, we gained a great deal of support and a great deal of unity. We didn't do that by conceding ground to the right in politics. We did that by sticking to the principles on which our party and all of our parties were founded, of one of socialism and social justice. The referendum happened in Britain in 2016. We campaigned to remain and reform, and there was a vote taken, as you well know, which resulted in um, Britain voting to leave the European Union. There is um, uh, an opportunity and a number of models here in operation. One is the right of the Conservative Party essentially want to crash out of Europe with no agreement and no deal at all and uh, set up some kind of uh, tax haven on the shores of Europe that would undermine all the principles of um, uh, common labour conditions and uh, uh, environmental protection and consumer rights across Europe. Or there is the alternative view that um, we would negotiate to ensure that we have a good trade arrangement with uh, tariff-free access to European markets. And at the same time, we legislate specifically in Britain, one, to guarantee European Union nationals full rights of residence and family reunion in Britain, 
Secondly, that we protect labor rights, particularly four weeks holiday, as well as paternity and maternity leave. And uh, we regulate to protect all the um, environment conditions. And we continue in the future not to undermine Europe in any other way, because we want to work with, uh, with Europe in that sense. But there was a referendum. We have to respect that result. We would want to remain partners and members of many of the European agencies. And crucially, we would maintain absolutely membership of the Council of Europe, of course, but also of the uh, European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention of Human Rights, and the universal freedoms that are guaranteed across Europe, because those were hard fought for by many people in the aftermath of the Second World War and since then, and I'm one who is very committed to a human rights agenda, not just within our continent, but in our relations with the rest of the world. And you ask those questions about relations with other countries. Uh, you mentioned, for example, Saudi Arabia, you mentioned Russia, you mentioned the USA. We would obviously want to have good relations with people. I want there to be a reduction in tensions between Europe and Russia at the same time as I also want to stand up for human rights within Russia as I would with any other country. They are, after all, members of the Council of Europe. But we have to look to a world where we uh, develop an agenda for peace and cooperation. And so the uh, proposal of the um, Trump administration in the USA to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal is, I think, very retrograde and very dangerous. That deal was achieved to bring about a de-escalation of tensions and also to encourage an improvement of human rights in Iran. I've been to Iran and taken part in many of those discussions. I don't want us to be walking away from those agreements. I want us to be walking towards better relations and better agreements that reduces tensions around the world, including um, activities within the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, as well as the, um, uh, obviously within the UN itself. The question was raised on Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is um, obviously a powerful country, obviously a very rich country. I cannot be the only person in this wonderful hall that is appalled by the weapons that are being used to bomb people in Yemen at the present time. And, uh, Emily Thornbury, who is our shadow foreign secretary, will, um, has made this very, very clear that we would want a suspension of arms sales to Saudi Arabia whilst they continue the bombing and the occupation of Yemen. The situation politically in Britain is one where the government has got a very strange tactic now of trying not to vote in Parliament whenever we put proposals up. This is only four months after an election uh, result was achieved in which uh, they emerged as the largest party but not in overall control. We, the Labour Party's membership is now up to 575,000 across the whole of the UK. We're campaigning all over the country all the time. And on the last National Campaigning Day, we had 450 simultaneous events all over the country. The Labour Party is bigger than it's been for many, many years, probably in all of my lifetime, more active than it's ever been. Our conference was the biggest we've ever held. We're a party of principles, we're a party of determination, we're a party of internationalism. We want to work with all of you to achieve a peaceful, just, just and more equitable world. Those are the Labour values that I am proud to represent as the party leader. Come back on the regulation of the Eva. Oh, sorry. And on the question of the regulations, thank you for your question. The points I was making in my contribution was that the technology used by Uber, by Amazon, by Deliveroo and other such companies is actually very brilliant and very clever technology. Technological developments ought to be things that benefit all of us. If you think of the broad sweep of history, Industrialization 
across Europe led to the most, most grotesque levels of inequality and eventually led to the growth of trade unions and the labor movement to try and bring about a more socialist and a, and a better world. We're now into a new industrial revolution with very high technology systems being introduced all over the world. High technology should not be the enemy of people, it should be their friend. But if it's used as a way of um, reducing wages, reducing living standards, removing workers' rights and conditions, then obviously everyone's going to be opposed to it. What we need is governments being prepared to intervene and challenge those companies and challenge those companies to employ people properly and that those technologies should be there for the benefit of all, not for the enormous profitability of a very small number of people. This is actually one of the biggest challenges that we as socialists face all over the world. Using technology for the benefit of all for shorter working week, for greater leisure time, for more equitable distribution of wealth or money, or are we going to stand aside, allow the deregulators to win, and allow inequality and poverty to follow as a result of it? I know which side I'm on. I know which side you're on in that debate. Thank you.